What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities. CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment your work stress disappears as you kayak through the canyons. Or the moment you discover the life-changing effects of prickly pear chocolate. But nothing beats the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the very first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com. You can get them, but can you keep them? When I walk, 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 Welcome back to another episode of the Girl Stop Playing Podcast. It's your favorite homegirl, Coriel, here to encourage you to stop playing with your potential and start working for what you want in life and in love. You already know that I'm bringing you the information and the conversations to help you make the money and get the honey. You can have it all as long as you are willing to work. Make sure that you don't just watch this video. Be sure to like Comment below with something that you learned. Subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. And go ahead and join our Patreon so that you can get all kinds of exclusive access, upcoming information, sneak peeks, and early access to our upcoming events. All right. Now, today's special business spotlight interview is one that I think is going to be a blessing for you because I thought that we were just here to talk about her business, but I think we gonna have to get in her business, okay? So welcome to the studio, Mrs. Dana Christian. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk to you <laughs> because I had one thing that I was prepared to talk mm -hmm. about, but I got some more stuff I want to talk about, so I'm excited. Um, but before we get into it, I do like to put some respect on people's names. When I have you on the couch, I know that the people are going to be running to the um, to the show description to find you on Instagram and, and follow you. But for those who may not know who you are, who is Dana Christian? So I am Dana Christian, the queen of business funding, a real estate investor turned developer, a mother, a wife, and a grandmother. I, come on, <laughs> real quick. I'm this, I'm this, I'm that, I got it. Okay. Okay, so let's start with the um, real estate. I want to jump into the real estate mm -hmm. part of it. Um, did taxes or real estate come first? So taxes. Taxes so, funded the real estate. No, I started doing taxes, and, and I'm telling my age right now, I hate this, around 1990. Right? Okay. I started doing taxes, only because I went to the IRS. I mean, I'm sorry, I went to... Um, What's that tax company name? The big Turbo one. Tax? No, the big company. Um, um, Lord. Okay, I went to go get my taxes done. We think H and R Block. H and R Block. I went to H and R Block for them to do my taxes, and they charged me five hundred dollars, and they gave me the paperwork. I'm like, this all they did for five hundred dollars? I can do this myself. So I started. So the next year, I did it myself, and I was working um, with these ladies. <clears throat> at the group home so I was saying well I can do your taxes you just have to wait three weeks and that's kind of how I started doing taxes what? so you did your own taxes because they I don't want to say they, I don't want to say they were scamming but they was overcharging yes because you know back then I just had a W-2 mm -hmm. so this was before they was doing it on the computer so you just plug and play mm. you know most things you can figure out by just reading right, right? we gotta read right <clears throat> so plug and play and I'm like this took me 10 minutes and you charge me $500, we ain't doing this. Mm -hmm. So that's what started me with the tax business back in 1990. So, okay, when you so then you turn around and started it. Did you did you charge $500? Or how no, did you decide what you were going to charge? Charging $25. Okay, hold on. So so you <laughs> said to yourself, self, they want to charge me 500, I'm not paying that. I'm going to do my own. I'm going to do yours, too, and I'm going to charge you $25. Yeah. What, what do you think that was? So you know what? Lack of knowledge, okay. right? N you know, now I know that you get paid for your experience, not as not for the time it takes you to do something. Right. Yep. Right? So back then, I'm thinking, oh, 10 minutes. 
$25, you know, which was a lot. When I was working the job paying $6 an hour, mm-hmm. you know, so, if, you know, if I look, I'm at this job for $6 an hour and I could do taxes in 10 minutes, even though it was just seasonal, you know, but still That's it was more nice than little, I was, Nice yeah. little seasonal pay. Then I was doing that while I was at work. But we, that mm. part. <laughs> okay, let's talk about that because the, so you were working at the post office. Right? Not at that not, time. I not, started working at the post office in 1996. Okay, got you, got you, got you. So the taxes were your side hustle before Correct. you even got into yeah, the post Yeah, when office. I was working at the group homes. Got mm-hmm. you, okay. So you knew that there, well, I don't know. You tell me, did you always know that there was a need to supplement your income? Or did you only just happen to get into doing taxes because of no, your tax it was story? it was a need. I was a single mom, grew up in New York, where we like to live ghetto fabulous. You always <laughs> want to look nice, want to have the kids fly. And you need money to do that. So I know that I needed more income, right? Because I dropped out of high school in ninth grade. So, Shut up. so it was no going to, you know, because you think going to college, getting a good job, that's the only way you was going to make money. So for me, it was having multiple streams of income. Mm-hmm. You know, it was times when I even worked three jobs, you know, to take care of these kids. Because like I said, you know, I was a teenage mom and I never wanted my kids to suffer. So I wanted them to have, look nice like the rest of the kids. You know, the mindset back then was, and your kids just fly, you're doing well. Mm-hmm. But that's not really they just well. Look good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so let me just say that I had my first child at 35 and one of the thoughts that I vividly remember asking myself was how the hell do teen moms do this how in the world Mm -hmm. did you do it yeah so it was rough and I remember I was 18 so I had one child 16 one child 17 I was 18 and one time I only had enough money for one box of pampers I went in the bathroom and cried my mom, she was not helping. Like I said, the kid's father was on drugs. I went in the bathroom and cried. I was ready to slit my wrist. My oldest daughter was banging on the door. I came out, hugged them. I was like, what the I'm going to do? I went and bought one box of Pampers. I bought a medium. So it was too big on one child, too small on the other. That was my turning point. I was like, I would never experience this again. Has things been rough? Yeah. But that was my turning point where, by any means necessary, I have to take care of these kids. Mm -hmm. So I had a sister that was older than me, one year older than me, and I was receiving welfare. So I went to the Kentucky Fried Chicken across the street, got in there a job in her name, right? (laughs) And so I could still receive my public assistance. And it was so crazy because when people would come into the Kentucky Fried Chicken, my show says Chevella, but my name is Dana. (laughs) And I'd be like, that's my, you know, that's my name. That's what they call me here. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But that was my turning point. So... I think from that point on, I just looked forward. I didn't think about what I had to do and just did it. Yeah. You know, so it it it's it been rough. It's It's been rough. And then the leaving school at ninth grade, mm-hmm. what, what did you do? Like, what was the next step? Okay, I'm not going back to school. Now what? So I got kicked out of the school because I what was What you was doing, Dana? Because you, know, you were pregnant. pregnant. Yeah, because you can't be in the regular high school, ninth grade. So did you they want be, you to go like so, alternative so, school? So I went to alternative school. Um, and I realized I wasn't learning nothing. Um, I got pregnant again with my second daughter. And I ended up getting my GED, I think, by the time um, my oldest, I had my second daughter, you know, started, like, getting my life together. Right? Um, but, yeah, it was it was rough. A lot of times, you know, we don't just, well, I don't just think about what I had to do and just do it. But it, it has been rough. And, you know, back then you get welfare, you know, and work a little siding jobs. How did you continue to sh- not just show up for your daughters, but like show up for yourself? Because a lot of times we can, a mom will turn into a superhero when it comes to these mm-hmm. babies. Like I'm mm-hmm. going to do whatever I need mm-hmm. to do for these kids. But a lot of times we put ourselves on the back burner. Mm-hmm. How did you manage to still show up for yourself enough to have that like that fire in you to go out and do the things mm-hmm. at such a young age with two babies and a mother that wasn't so supportive because mm-hmm. I knew nobody was coming to save me mm-hmm. and I had to be there for my kids I, I just knew no one was coming to save me and two daughters two daughters so team mom two daughters but your daughters were not team moms no actually my daughters didn't have kids so they was married so both of them is married um, yeah, they didn't have kids. Do you think the- that was a conscious thing? Like, was yeah. that a conversation? No, yes, because I always, 
I always talk to them about getting pregnant and having unprotected sex. That's only one thing's gonna happen. You have unprotected sex. You catch, you know, back then AIDS was like you can catch AIDS and you're gonna die. Period. That's you what know, you're telling me. You're gonna die. You have sex. You're gonna die. It's, <laughs> death. Okay, you're got unprotected. It. Like that's it. So really, just talk to them, and they watch me struggle. Right? They watch me work long hours. They watch me work three three jobs, and constantly talking to them. Like I said, one thing about having children at a young age, like they grew up kind of like as my friends in mm-hmm. a sense. When people say your kids shouldn't be your friends, no, it's okay because they can still respect you. As a parent, but I always spoke to them about everything. Mm -hmm. You know, like I have been arrested before. Talked to them about that and that whole, you know, situation. Why you shouldn't do this or why you shouldn't do that. (sighs) Listen, you know what I want to know. (laughs) Look, you know what I want to know. So, me and God got this thing Mm -hmm. that it's like God, anything. Yeah. So you, I'm not going to jail though. Whatever, whatever I got to go through, but I'm not going to jail. So. What? You know, and I'm not ashamed of the things you I've been because through. Look at yeah, you because now. it made me who the yes. person I am, and my kids learn from my lesson, right? So Lord. you gonna tell us why you went to jail? Come on, come on back. <laughs> okay, so you want to hear about the time I went to jail, or the time when I almost went to jail? Tell so, us both. So tell times. us both because you okay. was out here doing it. Okay. So um, I was transporting drugs okay. out of town. You know, a, a young parent growing up in New York. You know, all the street pharmacists, right? So, honestly, my kid's father had went to jail Mm -hmm. after he's decided to start smoking crack. He decided he wanted to sell crack in Maryland. He got arrested. So, guys he was in jail with needed some supply. You know, New Yorker was cheaper. So, I'm going out there taking them to drugs and stuff. Did he tell you this on the jail phone? I have. I'm so curious. So, yeah, he was like, I want you to talk to my my friends whatever yeah but you know before I said bottle up girl we would be here all day we get into all these all don't these give them the instruction manual okay wait right. we don't want to do that okay but yeah but he knew that I used to bottle up for people and knew where to get drugs from and stuff like that so he put me in touch with someone right so I was going back and forth taking the drugs to them giving them the money like I, they give me the money give them the drugs right so one particular time I was going to Washington D.C. because he was in Jalen Mountain I was going to Washington D.C. Washington, D.C., and normally I would put the drugs in a munch and crunch box, open up the box, sell it back. This time I was like, someone was like, don't do it. So I just put it in my bag. You remember the big coach, like, duffel bags? Kind of, sort of. <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah. So you I like- had this big red <laughs> duffel. So I had it right in there, right? And I had on, like, a, a jacket and, like, a cow neck shirt. So I'm getting off the train. A white lady with a denim um, denim um, suit come up to me, jacket and pants, pulled out her ID, was like, we're doing a routine search. My whole life flashed in front of me. So I was like, I just got off the train. I got to go to the bathroom. She was like, well, I stopped you. You have to come in the back because, you know, I knew I had the drugs. I was like, oh, Lord. So we walking in. I stuck my hand in my pocketbook. So when she turned the corner, I dropped it in my shirt. She went in the bathroom. So I was bending down. So she was like, um, I have to search you. So I was like, I don't have anything. I said, take my bag. I took off my jacket, right? Praying, Lord, please don't let this fall, fall down, out. Right? Yeah. God, I've been looking out for me. even. <laughs> so please don't let this fall out. I pulled down my pants and said, look, I don't have anything. So she went out the bathroom. I stuck it up in my vagina. Then when I came out, <clears throat> she passed search me. And that was it. Next time I just, I said, I'm not taking the train no more. I took the bus. Look, you so. didn't say I quit. She didn't say I'm not doing this no more. She said, so, I'm going to have to change the so way I do it. So that was the first time when I almost got arrested. So was it really a routine or was she there for you? Did she search other I, people? I, I don't you know. You don't know. Okay, I don't, okay. I don't know. But okay. I think they just do randoms. I don't know. Okay. And one thing, like, I never t- told anyone what I was doing. None of my friends in New York knew what I was doing. So I don't know if one of the guy's friends said, you know, these yeah. people got somebody coming, whatever, whatever. So that was the first time almost. So the second time was in 1998 when I actually got arrested. I was at the post office at that time. So you had your two daughters by this time. I had my two daughters by this time. And I was working at the post office, but prior to working at the post office, I was kind of, not kind of, I was. I was involved, like, in a scheme where I knew someone that was working at the welfare center. I wasn't working at the welfare center, but I had a lot of friends that worked at the welfare center. So 
I mean, that was receiving public assistance that went to that center. So my friends that work at the center was putting money on their case. Mm. I would go with them to the cash checking place, get the money, and get you know, them divide it. Yeah, yeah, we all divide it up. So when the heat, you know, baby said like, these kids got to eat, baby. <laughs> okay. So once the they start investigating and people start talking and then I, you know, Dana, because they didn't know the people that work at the center. You know, Dana was the middle person, so you. I got arrested. They had this was like in 1996, 1998, so they came to the post office and got me, and I got arrested. Um, I ended up getting probation. You know, you had you just stay in jail for that. You know, till you get around. I don't know, girl. I don't know. Look, I don't know. <laughs> for a couple of hours, yeah, I was I crying. Think about nerves, man. I was crying. So yeah, so the outcome of that was um, I ended up with two felonies. I had probation. And while my case was going on, I went out on suspension at the post office. But once the case was over, I went back to work at the post office. So in between that time, I was out for two and a half years from the post office. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, as the case went on. So I was out two and a half years. So the first six months, I lived off of my credit cards. And I was like, Dana, like, you got to get a job. So I went back to the group home, and I remember the first group home I applied for, because I had an attitude when I was out of work. Like, when I go out to eat or get my hair done, I'm not leaving no tip. You got a job. Then I had was like, Dana, get yourself together. <laughs> get yourself together. So anyway, I went and got a job, and the first job they called me was paying $6 an hour. When I left the post office, it was at $13. And I was like, you know what? You got to crawl before you walk. So the next week, another job called me for $9, then the... The next week, another job called me for twelve dollars, and I saw I ended up working three jobs during that time. Wow! Yeah. Okay. What was so the that conversation? Was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot. Look, that was <laughs> that was so much to unpack, only because of like the full circle. Because we yeah. didn't even got into like who you are now. Yeah. So they, y'all yeah, heads so gonna, they, gonna be spinning. Yeah, y'all so wigs they, gonna be sliding yeah, so when we, you get to what you yeah, we where you are two, now. Two thousand. Yeah, two thousand. When I, I want to know what the, the conversation was like though with your daughters. About. How much did they know about what was going on? Because they, you didn't like go to jail for weeks. No, they so they <clears throat> they knew everything because every time I went to court, I came, I was crying the day before because I didn't know what was going to happen. Who's going to take care of my kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they knew what was going on. How did you talk to them about that? Was it was it just like you know, mommy made a mistake, or you know, like what was the? How did you make them understand what was yeah, happening? Just told them what was going on that I was involved in some scam some fraudulent activities and I got arrested Damn. and you know I got to go to court and we're going to put it out and go to jail and they were like okay mommy we got your back mm -hmm. that is so scary oh my mm -hmm. word wow okay okay so this is what year <laughs> what year we at so we had we had 2000 so 2000 I went back to work at the post office okay because the case is so, so you, you there's two <clears throat> felonies but you didn't have to do any jail time I didn't have to do any jail time wow Okay, mm -hmm. God, God yeah. got you. Yeah, God be looking out. Okay, definitely. so you go back to you go back to the post office, mm -hmm. and then where does real estate come in? So real estate came in in two thousand six. So this was all happening in New York. I moved down to Georgia two thousand four. Transferred the post office job to Georgia. Um, I used to get anxiety attacks at the post office. <clears throat> like I just I just hated it. Um, and, you know, my husband, we both knew that real estate was the way people build wealth. So we started investing in real estate. But back then, it was no uh, mentorship or, mm -hmm. you know, because IG wasn't heavy. So it was just whatever you see on HGTV, mm -hmm. right? We assuming we're going to buy this house for $140,000, put 40000 in it. This house was going to work 300000 and we was going to just rent and repeat and be millionaires. It didn't work like that? It didn't work like that. We made 17000 which was still good. And we went into buy and hold because it was a lot of time for that monthly cash flow. But back then, we was using our own cash. I started actually with a equity line of credit from my primary home. Okay, so that's what that's what I wanted to know was the starting point because I think that we are bombarded with the idea of getting into real estate. Like mm -hmm. I think we have connected the dots that real estate is one of the uh, best ways to, mm -hmm. to generate wealth. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, okay, where do I start? I yeah. got a thousand dollars or I got five hundred dollars to money. How how can I make this make sense? So that's what I wanted to know is like you knew that real estate was the thing, but how did you connect the current yeah. resources yeah. to actually being able to get into that? But you took a line of credit on so, property you already yeah. own. So I took out a uh equity line. When you visit Arizona, time is measured in moments, not minutes. Like the moment you see the Grand Canyon for the first time. Visit a new state of mind. Learn more at hereyouareaz.com.
on the credit on our primary resident. But I'm going to be honest, I'm a t I'm not going to recommend that for people, okay. okay? Because that's the only resource I knew, right? But now if you have good credit, you can use business credit cards. Mm. I purchased over 26 doors using business credit cards, right? With, I saw this on your Instagram mm -hmm. with something with a P. The, 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 the site. Something with a P. Oh, plastic. 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 Yes, plastic. yes, yes. So plastic okay. is what you use to liquidate the credit cards, right? Gotcha. So, you know, of course, you can't go to a title company and swipe a credit card, but you can use plastic. And it's real simple, right? You go to plastic, you put in your credit card information. They want to know where the money is going. You give them the HUD statement or purchase and sales agreement, and they wire the money directly to the title company, right? So the reason I don't recommend... Um, equity line of credit on a, a person primary resident because that's where you live at, mm -hmm. right? And if you things happen in real estate, right? So don't play with your primary resident. Take that chance if you have other resources. I didn't know about other resources. Then. Gotcha. So when you say I, I've, I've purchased twenty six doors with these credit cards, what are these limits? What are the limits on these credit cards so, for this to no. be possible? So yeah, make, so, make it make sense. Okay, so I'm in the Cleveland market. Okay, right. So houses there, you can get twenty thousand, thirty thousand, right? Mm -hmm. I, the, I think the most expensive house I bought was seventy thousand. That was a fix and flip. So I might have twenty thousand dollars on the credit card. So you can have multiple credit cards. I wish I would have bought my little baggie of credit cards. How but, many credit cards you got? A lot. It's a lot. Probably about a hundred. If not active so, open account mm -hmm, business credit cards, yeah, I have like one point seven million in business credit cards. If not, so more is your than personal credit like eight hundred? So listen, that's the thing. Your personal credit don't have to be at eight hundred, right? And it's not about credit scores; about credit profile, right? Mm -hmm. So really, what's in the profile? How long you have had credit? Right. So they looking to get business credit cards. They looking for at least two years. The higher the limit on your personal credit cards, the better. So the limit should be at least $5,000 or more, right? Um, utilization should be under 30%, ideally 10%, no late payments, no charge off, no bankruptcies. So if you have a good credit profile, your credit score is going to be above 700, mm -hmm. right? So I don't like to say, oh, your credit score is 750, you want to get access to it because your credit profile might not meet the qualifications. Mm. So you could be out here in the 700 club, and still not qualifying because <laughs> correct you have late payments or your utilization. Sh that utilization. Let me just tell you my own little business. Okay, <laughs> that utilization is that what gets most people? Yes, that's what gets me. It's like, but I got thirty thousand. You don't yeah. want me to spend no ten and one. And the crazy thing is, banks lend you money when you don't need money. So that's why it's important to switch over to business as soon as possible, business credit cards, because it doesn't report to your personal. So you can max out all your business credit cards and your personal credit will still stay, say, in the 700. Is that if you don't do a PG? It doesn't no, even report? if you do a PG, they're going to do a hard pull. Okay, I'm going to need to talk to you because what yeah. what's showing you want, up on mine yeah, then? It might be Capital One. You want to stay away from Capital One business. How she know my business? <laughs> it is definitely Capital One because I'm sitting here thinking like, no, nah, it's reporting. Yeah, cap Capital One business discover business and td banks business those three business credit cards report to your personal stay away from those stay stay away dang i wish stay. i would have had this conversation yeah stay, stay away yeah okay. stay away oh, okay so y'all i'm sorry i'm about to just ask my own personal question so in this situation because you're not supposed to close cards are you no don't. so what would you recommend just leave it and don't use it okay yeah, just leave it. Especially if it's that's your. I'm pretty sure that's not your no. oldest card. Mm -mm. So you could close it, but just does leave that hurt it. your your report if you close accounts? If it's your oldest card, okay, okay. If it's your oldest card and your highest limit card, then yes. But you can just leave it, pay it down, and just leave it because you know what makes up a good credit profile. Also, is the more accounts you have, positive accounts, right? right? So just pay it, leave it because it's no annual fee. Right. If it was an annual fee, then I'd be like, yeah, close it. But there's no annual fee, so okay, you can just you can just leave it. Okay, let me get back. Uh, <laughs> let me get back focused. Um, I did want to get into business credit though because I think there's a com there's a lot of confusion around some terminology. Okay. So there's business credit. There is business credit cards. There's business funding. There are business loans. There's mm -hmm. working capital. All of these things that I've heard about. Mm -hmm. What do these things mean? Okay, so when we think about the term business credit, mm -hmm. right? 
that's just like personal credit, right? A personal credit score. Mm -hmm. So a business credit score. In order to get a business credit score, you have to apply for accounts with different vendors, which is stores like, you know, um, Lowe's, Granger, right? So you apply for these accounts, right? You buy something and then they report to Mm -hmm. your credit report business credit report to give you a business credit score, just like personal, right? right? If you don't have anything on your personal credit, like a credit card, a loan, you won't have a credit score, right? Right. So that's what all business credit is, is just building business credit to get a credit score, right? The ideal credit score is an 80, paydex, right? Now, if you go through the process of building business credit, get an 80, you cannot walk into a bank, like Bank of America apply for their business credit card, um, with just that without PGN. Okay. Unless your business is making millions and you can show profit and loss statements. Okay. Right. But um, f- to get business funding, you will have to PG, right? Okay. Most times. Okay. Right. Now, there are accounts where you can just use your business credit score. It's like Divi, mm-hmm. right? We have Bricks, we have Capital on Tap, right? Those are based off of your business revenue. Okay. It's how they um, qualify you. But those have to be paid in full in 30 days. Okay. Right? So why do that when, you can, when yeah. you can PG and get a Bank of America business credit card, 0% interest for up to 12 months, and it's revolving? Gotcha. Right? So, you know, a lot of times we want to take shortcuts and don't want to fix our credit, but we need to fix our credit. That's the only way you're going to be able to get access to a lot of funding, right? So you also have um, accounts like, say, Blue Vine. They will lend you money off of your business revenue, but the interest rate is really high. Like, I have saw this person post on Instagram how they got a client $70,000 from this company. Um, I think it was Hedgeway, right? But what they fell to put that the monthly payment was $5,000. How can your business grow with if those? all of the money is going to... And yeah. if it was a business credit card, even if it was... Two credit cards, uh, three credit cards equaling up $70,000. You're talking about $700 payment. Right. Right. We got to think about how can we scale our business in the most effective way. Mm-hmm. And that is getting the che- cheapest money that you can possibly get, which is business credit cards. Right. So business funding is just meaning getting biz- funding in your business name. Gotcha. That's all it is. So for someone out there or even someone in here, mm-hmm. perhaps me, <laughs> who hears, we hear these conversations, right? Especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're always hearing the conversation mm-hmm. around business credit. And then behind that conversation, it's always, but get your personal credit together mm-hmm. to be able to really do yes. what you need to do with this. Mm-hmm. What would be, and then we know like Dave Ramsey's snowball, paying down the debt. Like, mm-hmm. do you have a um, philosophy or like a recommendation for like where to start? So, yes. So definitely start with, you know, get a copy of your credit report, right? Because most people say, well, I have. I don't want to see that thing. Yeah. But get a copy of your credit report, right? So what you're looking for, the first thing is for negative items, right? Mm -hmm. So anything that's in collections, charge off. And it will be stated on there if it's collections or charge off. Then you want to go through the credit repair process to get that removed, right? So, it doesn't matter if you didn't pay that T-Mobile bill. What matters is if it's reporting accurate because under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, it states that credit bureaus, well, they're really agencies, right? Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian must report 100% accurate and complete information and the burden of proof is on them, mm-hmm. right? And sometimes we got to learn to use Google a little bit or chat, the chat GPT that, you know, can help us to figure out how to write a letter. We can but, use AI to, use, to write... Oh. Mm-hmm. To write, write that the, down in your notebook. Write, okay. You know what I'm saying? To write, you know, letters to get these items removed, right? So now look at your utilization on your cards, right? Because utilization is another thing that affects your credit report. So if your credit limit is, let's just say $6,000, once you use over $2,000, it's going to decrease your credit score. Right. So we got to make sure that we keep that low and then inquiries. Don't just apply for stuff. If you know your credit score starts with a four, five or six, that means you owe somebody some money. Right. So don't keep on applying because no one's going to lend you money. And I always tell people this. I love using this this analogy. Let's just say your cousin asks your brother and sister to borrow money and they don't pay them back. 
and then come ask you, what are you going to say? You're going to say no. Nope. So <clears throat> banks is the same way. If they look on your credit report, be like, oh, you didn't pay T-Mobile back. You didn't pay Capital One back. Why would I lend you money? And even if I had one person, even if the collection was $60, be like, it's only $60. That's what the banks are saying. It's only $60. If you, you didn't even have $60, $60 how are you going to pay me back $10,000? Mm -hmm. Right? But the good thing about credit, it can always be restored, rebuilt, repaired. But your life would change if you have good credit. So is cash flow the key to, to, to repairing your credit? Yes. Because if you don't have cash to pay down these balances... So you have to, so you have to figure out a way to make some extra money. Increase your cash flow to, yeah, to get your to credit make, together. Yeah, and even if it's going on a budget. Right? Because sometimes we, we have extra money somewhere. Right. So really just writing down, you know, like spend a month seeing exactly where all your money is going. Right. And then write down all your credit cards balance and at least the minimum payment that you need to make every month. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's just say for even number six, we have five credit cards and let's just say you look at your your um, budget. Be like, OK, I have five hundred dollars I can allocate to this every month. Right. So you look at your credit card that have the smallest balance. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the one you're going to put most of the money on. Right. So let's just say the four for the credit cards, the minimum payment, let's just say it's fifty dollars. Right. So that's two hundred. That's fifty. That's two hundred dollars. That leaves you another three hundred dollars. So the three hundred dollars put it on the smallest limit, the lowest limit one. Every month do that. Then once that one is paid off, now you have four credit cards left. We repeat the cycle. Fifty on three, right? That's one fifty, and then the rest, and the rest on the fourth lowest one until you eventually become debt free. Because I can, like, I filed bankruptcy back in two thousand. Once I was out of work for the three years, two and a half years, and spent my credit, then I filed bankruptcy. But I got in debt again. I think I was about maybe forty thousand in debt. So I was like, oh, I'm gonna put together a two year plan to pay mm -hmm. this down. And a lot of times we are so impatient. I was going to say, yeah, that's two years. That's yeah, we time. are so impatient, but time be going by so fast. And the question I always ask somebody when they say, well, credit repair takes so long. How long is it going to take you to save $100,000? That part. Right? Most people don't save it in their lifetime. Right? So if you can fix your credit, not saying that credit repair is going to take a year, but it might. Right? So if you can fix your credit and then in a year time you can get access to $100,000, will it be worth it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And like you said, just your lifestyle, the things mm -hmm. that you can Sometimes do, the way got, that you can yeah. live with, mm -hmm. with whew, ain't no way around it. Is the, no. it, it. At the end of the day, there's no way around it. It's either you might as well get a plan together now or you're going to pay for it later. Yeah. And having bad credit is expensive. You pay yes. higher interest rates. It is. When you go cut on utilities, you have to do a, a deposit. Like bad credit is really expensive. It is. Okay. So real estate do's and don'ts because let me, let me just say, and you... You're probably going to side at me for this. <laughs> um, my only experience in terms of real estate is like Airbnb. So mm -hmm. we've purchased a property to put on Airbnb. We sub, we've sub we sublet properties to put on Airbnb. We have a tiny house that's on Airbnb. Mm -hmm. That is my experience, short-term mm -hmm. rentals. Mm -hmm. When I met my husband, he had, I think he only had one at this time, but one long-term rental property. Mm -hmm. And I, I think based on the calculations, he might have been making like $300 a month mm -hmm. off this property. Mm -hmm. In my mind... I'm like, bro, you're doing all of that mm -hmm. for three hundred dollars a month. This can't be worth it. <laughs> I think now mm -hmm. I probably didn't really know what I was talking about. Comparing, you know, short term with long term, obviously making three thousand a month sounds, you know, mm -hmm. much better than this three hundred dollar you're getting off mm -hmm. of a long -term, long term rental property. In your experience, what is like the average, or is there an average? in terms of like cash flow for mm -hmm. long-term rental properties and what is actually, like what makes it worthwhile mm -hmm. for you to get in, involved? So for me, for long-term, right? So the average, it depends on where, where it's at, right? So like I have a property in um, Covington, that one I get nine hundred dollars a month positive cash flow, mm. right? That's so. When you say positive cash flow, that means I, on top of your mortgage. Yeah, yeah, because she pays fifteen, um, fourteen, fourteen, fifteen, and you have and a six hundred dollar mortgage or something. Five hundred like and okay. change, yeah. 
So that one, $900. Um, a property that I had in Atlanta that I bought since 2006, which I'm getting ready to Airbnb that one now, I had a long-term rental on that one for 15 years. And that's a whole nother story. So we ain't going to get into that <laughs> one right now. But that one, I was only making $200 a month. How is that right? worth it? So tax, okay, tax deduction, because now I was working at the post office. So okay. I never paid any taxes, right? Gotcha. So, but that one... I bought that one. I didn't know what I was doing, okay. right? So now in Cleveland, I have duplexes that I make sixteen hundred dollars a month. So it's about a thousand dollars cash flow. In um, Baltimore, I have a house that one is about nine hundred dollars cash flow. So it just depends on where it's at. So even if it's two, three hundred dollars, right? Sometimes it can be worth it, right? But I don't like anything under five hundred okay. right now. So it could be worth it because you're not constantly dealing. With day to day, you know, Airbnb sometimes is a lot of turnover, making time. sure, mm -hmm. you know, the, the house is clean, clean and stuff like that. But you building wealth on in long term. Right. So back to the house in Atlanta. So we purchased that one in 2007 for eighty seven, eighty seven thousand dollars. Mm. Now the house is worth five and change. Mm. So I'm thinking another 20 years is going to be worth a million dollars. Right. As things turn. So it's building my net worth. At the same time, receiving cash flow. So it's me just being impatient. Yes. This is really so, a long-term strategy, and it's, it's not about Correct. how much you're making today. Correct. But you do want to make something. Gotcha. You, you and do. for you, it's at least $500. To me, it's at least $500. It's at least $500. So you do a lot in Cleveland right now. Mm -hmm. How did you decide that Cleveland was the market you wanted to move into? So I don't know how I came across Cleveland, like in 2018, um, just searching Zillow for houses, and I don't know how Cleveland came up. I don't, and then I just started looking. But it's a gold mine. And yes, you get duplexes back then, five, ten thousand dollars. Still now, like twenty thousand dollars. You know, you can be all in the duplex, say eighty thousand dollars, and it can cash flow you fifteen hundred dollars a month. So mm -hmm. what's that return on investment? Almost twenty percent. Mm -hmm. You're not getting that anywhere. You know, and sometimes I hear people say, what's in Cleveland? A gold mine. And honestly, when you get off that plane, people don't look like us getting off that plane. Exactly. You know, and every every state has its hood. You know, you think about Harlem back 20, 30 years ago. Now, mm -hmm. people don't really look like, like things right. is changing. changing. Yep. So it's like you want to get in before it changes. So many times we want to get in after, after the change when the prices is high. Right? But... um. Real estate is the way to go to build wealth. So tell the people, I have something. Can you come back? Because mm -hmm. we didn't even talk about your husband. <laughs> like we, I have more. Please come back. I, I asked her on camera. Put the camera on her. Put the camera on her. Will you come back? Yes. Okay, she'll be back. Yes. Um, seriously, because yes. I... I've been telling the people, like, season two, we're really moving into the life behind the business. Mm -hmm. But this is such great information because we don't want to work all day. Like, no. whether you're an entrepreneur or an employee, you don't want to work all day. Correct. So to have some of these strategies um, and just the knowledge behind mm -hmm. what's possible, I think it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, but I know you have, I think it's a day with Dana mm -hmm. that you do. You have so many resources. Mm -hmm. We have your Instagram up somewhere it's gonna mm -hmm. be in the um, description too because you're always sharing information mm -hmm. um but let the people know like what resources do you have available for people who are interested in getting into real estate or interested in building up their business credit like mm -hmm. look into your camera mm -hmm. and tell them what you got for them so i have the ladder to passive income which is a financial literacy program teach you how to leverage credit to build wealth through real estate um, rental car business building business credit getting access to funding really getting you on the road to building wealth and leaving that paycheck to paycheck lifestyle behind. Because like I said, I worked for the post office for 25 years and just recently retired. And when I got injured on the job, it was five months before I got paid. And that's kind of like what started my journey because I'm like, how many people do I know still working injured but can't report it because they can't go out of work? So my thing is always being prepared for the unexpected. Yes. COVID taught us. Yes. Co if, if, ain't no, yes. if ain't nothing else teach you that you got to be prepared to pivot, yeah. COVID has taught us. So definitely make sure you are staying connected with Dana. She is all things passive income. Yes. Okay. So get in where you fit in. Follow her on social media. Make sure you subscribe to the channel so that you mm -hmm. don't miss out on any more amazing conversations. Y'all, I know this was good. I'm not even going <laughs> to ask y'all if it was good because I know it was juicy. I have learned so much. Mm -hmm. I definitely enjoyed um, connecting with you, conversing mm -hmm. with you. And I know 
know my people loved it. So go on over to Dana's Instagram. Tell her where you found her Mm -hmm. right here on Girl Stop Playing. And make sure you come back next week for our next episode. I'll see you there. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers. Every day, we rise, challenging ourselves to work for what we believe in. At U.S. Border Patrol, Protecting our borders is more than a job. It's a calling. Agents answer the call, working together to keep our country and communities safe. If you are ready for a new mission, join U.S. Border Patrol and go beyond. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.